Canto 14, Circle 7, Round 3. The Violent Against God, Nature, and Art. Love of that land was our common source, moved me to tears. I gathered up the leaves and gave them back. He was already hoarse. We came to the edge of the forest where one goes from the second round to the third, and there we saw what fearful arts the hand of justice knows. To make these new things wholly clear, I say, we came to a plain whose soil repels all roots. The wood of misery rings it the same way the wood itself is ringed by the red foss. We paused at its edge. The ground was burning sand, just such a waste as Cato march across. O oh, endless wrath of God, how utterly thou hast become a terror to all men who read the frightful truths revealed to me. Enormous herds of naked souls I saw, lamenting till their eyes were burned of tears. They seemed condemned by an unequal law, for some were stretched supine on the ground, some squatted with their arms about themselves, and others, without pause, roamed round and round. Most numerous were those that roamed the plain. Far fewer were the souls stretched on the sand, but moved to louder cries by greater pain. And over all that sand on which they lay or crouched or roamed, great flakes of flame fell slowly as snow falls in the Alps on a windless day. Like those Alexander met in the hot regions of India, flames raining from the sky to fall still unextinguished on his legions, whereat he formed his ranks and at their head set the example trampling the hot ground for fear the tongues of fire might join and spread, just so in hell descended along the rain upon the damned, kindling the sand like tinder under a flint and steel, doubling the pain. In a never-ending fit upon those sands, the arms of the damned twitched all about their bodies, now here, now there, brushing away the brands. Poet? I said, master of every dread we have encountered, other than those fiends who sallied from the last gate of the dead. Who is that wraith who lies along the rim and sets his face against the fire in scorn so that the rain seems not to mellow him? And he, himself, hearing what I had said to my guide and lord concerning him, replied, what I was living, the same I am now, dead Though Jupiter wear out his sooty smith, and from whom on my last day he snatched in anger the jagged thunderbolt he pierced me with, though he wear out the others one by one who labor at the forge at Mongibello, crying again, Help! Help! Help me, good Vulcan! As he did Flagra, and turned down endlessly with the power of heaven in his arm, small satisfaction would he win from me. At this, my guide spoke with such vehemence as I had not heard from him in all of hell. Oh, Capanius, by your insolence, you may, you're may made to suffer as much fire inside as falls upon you. Your only rage could be fit torment for your sullen pride. Then he turned to me more gently. That, he said, was one of the seven who laid siege to Thebes. Living, he scorned God, and among the dead, he scorns him yet. He thinks he may detest God's power too easily, but as I told him, his slobber is a fit badge for his breast. Now, follow me, and mind for your own good, you do not step up the burning stand, but keep well back along the edge of the wood. We walked in silence then, till we reached a rill, that gushed from the woods. It ran so red, the memory sends a shudder through me still. As from the Bulakami Springs, the stream, the sinful women keep to their own use, so down the sand the rill flowed out in the stream. The bed and both its banks were petrified, as were its margins. Thus I knew at once our passage through the sand lay by its side. Among all other wonders I have shown you, since we came through the gate, denied to none, noting your eyes, have seen is equal to the marvel of the rill by which we stand, for it stifles all the flame above its course, and it flows out across the burning sand.
So spoke my guide across the flickering light, and I begged him to bestow on me the food for which he had given me the appetite. In the middle of the sea, and gone to waste, there lies a country known as Crete, he said, under whose king the ancient world was chased. Once Rhea chose it as the secret crypt, the cradle of her son, the better to hide him, her Corabantes raised a den when he wept. An ancient giant stands in the mountain's core. He keeps his shoulder turned towards Diameta and looks towards Rome as if it were his mirror. His head is made of gold, of silver work, his breast and both his arms of polished brass, the rest of his great torso to the fork. He is of chosen iron from there down, except that his right foot is terracotta. It is the foot he rests more weight upon. Every part except the gold is split by a great fissure from which endless tears drip down and hollow out the mountain's pit. Their course sinks to his pit from stone to stone, becoming Acheron, Phlegathon, and Styx. Then, by this narrow sluice, they hurtle down to the end of all descent and despair into Cocytus. You shall see what sink there is with your own eyes. I pass it in silence here. And I to him. But if these waters flow from the world above, why is this rill met only along this shelf? And he to me, you know the place is round. And though you have come deep into the valley through the many circles, I always bearing left along the steep, you have not traveled any circle through its total round. Hence, when new things appear from time to time, it's, it, that hardly should surprise you. And I, where shall we find Phlegathon's course and Lethe's? One you omit, and of the other you only say the tear flood is its source. In all you ask of me, you please me truly, he answered. But the red and boiling water should answer the first question you put to me. And you shall stand by Lethe, but far hence, there, where the spirits go to wash themselves when their guilt has been removed by pittance. And then he said, Now it is time to quit. The edge of shade. Follow close after me along the rill, and do not stray from it. From the unburning margins, form a lane, and by them we may cross the burning plain.